Sorry for, for well, yeah. Yeah, so the first version that we built was actually a mashup of uh, multiple technologies. It was not comfortable. We were using Python, we were using Node.js, we were using a lot of different uh, stuff there. And uh, we were facing a lot of challenges, and we went on to building a distributed uh, scanning infrastructure at Yahoo. And uh, we were looking for uh, one platform which could give us like everything we wanted. and. Uh, Go seemed pretty promising, uh, but it was new, so we were kind of a little scared as to how it will go. But I th actually, it went pretty well. And uh, we had a lot of challenges. Then we were, dis we, were we were looking for a good distributed uh, platform, and uh, we were running into uh, issues with uh, concurrency with Python. And we uh, really liked the uh, the way Go handles uh, concurrency natively, which is I think uh, pretty amazing. Uh, we had troubles with the uh, error handling. You know, when you build a big system and you have less people, it is difficult to trace bugs. And when you uh, have to do that in live production system, it becomes very difficult. So, Go is like type safe language. It told us like when we were like uh, not coding good at all. So, it was catching a number of bugs for us. Uh, and then uh, we had trouble with you know. Uh, Writing quality code, you know, ensuring we had good enough unit test cases, we had good enough uh, functional acceptance tests, uh, and also looking at the memory management, how we were doing. So Go pretty much gave us everything, and ultimately we figured out like this is giving us what Python and Java and C would usually give, and uh, we went with Go. And uh, the way it went was like it took us about two months, mostly Albert doing a porting from what we had earlier and making it ready for open source in Go. OK, so we're going to get into uh, the reasons why we uh, took on the journey of building a scanning infrastructure, like what were the common gaps we were struggling with. We struggled a lot with, and then we finally built something which actually solves the problems. OK, the first one is uh, the never-ending never story of crawling. So I've been a paranoid at Yahoo for about five years, and uh, I used to work with, like, about 2,500 engineers, and uh, I would ask them, like, OK, so what is our tool saying? He's saying, yeah, it has been running for like two weeks. I said, OK. So I had never had a good answer, right? So the crawling is still going on. I talked to like a finance guy, and like, OK, what is to finance.yahoo.com? Yeah, it is still going on. So it was not a good thing to have. And I would say, OK, stop the scan. Let's see what you have. And pretty much it is still crawling on the first few levels. It has never gone deeper, right? So we had those issues. And pretty much, if you look at a crawler these days, uh, they're essentially blind. They do not know what the context is unless you train them to understand a context. So for instance, uh, if you look at a site which has a parameter Yahoo or a Flickr, you cannot tell just by looking at the URL if it is a same code driving and give, getting you the content or it's a different code. Essentially, from a security point of view, from a security context, we are only looking for the code which is generating the content, not the content itself. So we were never interested in the content. We were interested in what the engines, what the template or the code was that was generating those pages. And we had like, this is, these are like just few examples, and we had like plenty of them, and we couldn't like figure out a good way until, uh, yeah. So yeah, we thought about these things. Uh, you know, we, we thought like maybe we could have more machines. You know, we could like scale it. Probably you would end up doing a self denial of service because, you know, you're like consuming the bandwidth of your applications when you're doing it from inside. Uh, we also had this issue, you know, we file one true finding. We're very happy about that. But the engineer says, you know, you have given me like 100 reports and they all are the same issue, same code generating the. So it becomes difficult to manage issues and countries integration you need to finish the scans and like because we have uh, some of the products which are like you uh, check in the code and you know they are like the check-ins are happening about like 10 20 50 times a day so you want to ensure like your scanner is at least faster than the a day at least you know okay so what it looked like so with the existing scanners and crawlers that we had or the ones we tried, this is what it turned out to be. You could not make any sense out of like what the application was doing. There's just a bunch of you know 
links and you cannot make like what the real application is and so we started building this uh, uh, you know technique in our scanners in our crawlers which would essentially do this so pretty much look at a page like we are doing right now and you know concluding like hey guys you know these two pages look pretty much the same to me i'm going to call the first one as unique the second one as a duplicate so we needed to build an engine of this sort and this was not like one off example this is like across yahoo you see like this you have one uh, code path generating you know multiple uh, you know articles across our sites so this is how it looks like you know you this is very common at media companies or companies who are building like social applications video uh, search applications so you have a uh, uh, pretty much a router which essentially looks for the uh, URL and then essentially passes on, it on to a code path which will generate a content fetch from your database and serve it back. So we were only essentially looking for these kind of patterns and not the ones we saw earlier. And But you know, you don't have access to the source code when you're doing a scanning from, you know, when you're doing a dynamic scan from your uh, network. What we were looking for was something that could do this, which is like, look at the source code, see what is the page structure, and not worry about what the page content is. So not worry about what the blue part is, but worry about the red part. So yeah, so essentially mask out the data from the page structure. And uh, once we did that, this is what we got. So results were like pretty encouraging. We essentially got the uh, map of the code that would be generating those content, right? So you look at how we did that, and I'll hand it over to Albert to describe the entire algorithm. Yeah. So sure, thanks, Vishen. So we want to do some deep dive on how we're actually doing that. So in simpler world, we just remove the content. It looks fine, but if you remove the content and still try to do some diff of that, you will still tell you there's some difference of that. So we figure out like, if we want to compare two pages, we actually need to measure how similar they are. And the good thing is, in the academic world, there's already algorithm that can do that. And here's one of that that we actually source out and then we implement that. So the algorithm that we use is called Moses Simhash. And it was decided for comparing whether two articles are similar, and we modify that in to measure whether two HTML are similar or not. So the, the basic idea is that we got the HTML, and then we extract the HTML into tokens using some existing library in the Go language that they allow you to pass the HTML, convert them into token. That means like if it's a tag, if it's an attribute, it will just tell you, oh, this is attribute with the name something or this is a text node, and you will tell you this is a text node. So based on that, we, we compute the SIM hashes, which is basically a 64-bit fingerprint. We compute SIM hash for both, both sides. And once you have the 64-bit fingerprints, you can do a Hamming distance comparison. That means you can count how many bits are different in the 64 bits. So using that, you can basically get an idea how much bits are the same, how much bits are different. So we figure out that we can use a FASO more like 95%. If the pages, they have 95% of bits, they are the same, we call them similar. So here's a more illustrative idea how this algorithm works. So basically, when you have HTML, we will extract the HTML into tokens. And what we want to do is to convert this HTML token into one 64-bit fingerprint that we can compare against different pages. So the SimHash algorithm works in the way that, first of all, you need to convert your HTML token into features. So for example, we will say this is a stock tag, and we will say this stock tag actually have a tag name H1. This is a text node, and then we'll say this is basically text node. We, we give them an enumer enumeration, more like the tab, the tab of that. So this is an end tag. This is another stock tag. And the, hash, the SimHash algorithm, if you look inside, is very simple and straightforward. 
they will just hash the features using some non-cryptographic hashes. Basically, you generate another 64-bit integer for each feature. So in the end, you get like you, how many tokens you got, then you, have, then you got how many hashes and how many fingerprints. And in order to combine all the fingerprints together, you count whether you have more ones or more zero in the first bit, and then you mark, like, if we have more zero, then we say the first bit is zero. If you have more one, then the, the bit will be one. And then you generate a 44-bit fingerprint. So let's do an example of that. So the good thing is that if I'm using Go language, I can do the presentation right away and then run the program and then you can see. So we, we actually have two pages. Those are from Ficker. They're like Ficker in an album. We have two different, two different photos. And what we want to do is that fetch them and to compute the fingerprint and then also compute the distance. So let's see the result. So you can see for Ficker, we have two different photo pages. And if you just do a simple text, div, of course, you would get a lot of different things. But for us, you can see the fingerprint is actually exactly the same. So the feature distance, the distance of them is zero. That means they're 100% identical. So this gives us a really good way that we can say we just need to scan one of the page, not the other. Let's do this exercise again. We can compare Yahoo and Ficker. So you can see the fingerprints is a little bit different. They have, they have more like a distance of seven. Actually, anything more than 95, lower than 95% is, is more like unique pages. So this one, they're pretty much unique in many different ways. So anyone want any other pages? We can test it right away. Yeah, what's the? Forum page. Forum? Like, do you have the URL? Maybe I can test Facebook. Yes. Because I can only remember the top domain of those. Yeah, let's see. Is it .com? Maybe it's the internet problem. Let's see. Yeah. So you can see, like, you can use that for any other web pages, and it also can tell you what is the distance. So for Reddit and Flickr, the distance is 13, and the similarity is more, lower than 79%. Okay, so I guess some of you may, uh, if you're very, very good in mathematics, you actually will figure out I'm, I'm actually lying because there's one of, one of the things we need to add into the sim hashes to make sure to make it work. So if you look at sim hashes, basically you uh, actually calculate all the hashes and then you compute the count bits operation. That actually means that if you have a HTML that some of the elements come before the other, like the ordering, it should actually get destroyed when you when you try to compute a fingerprint. Like if you have H1 coming before H2 or H2 coming before H1, they generate the same fingerprint. So the way SimHash could, you can fix SimHash in the way that we can add ngram. That means you can actually expand the sequence in, in merging the loca locality uh, property into the fingerprint. So how does that work is like if we have a two gram algorithm, we can combine like every, every element before and after into one token. So in that case, this is H1 and H2, they become one token, and H2 and H3 become another one. So that the locality information can bake into the fingerprint, and you will help to us avoid the problem that some of the page, they just have different order of element, and we still want to have that feature captured in the fingerprint. So, <clears throat> do you want to? Yeah, so, okay. so uh, coming back, so how has been our experiment over the last uh, one and a half years? So uh, we had pretty good uh, 
success in what we're trying to achieve, which is like finishing the scans fast and accurately. Uh, so with the threshold of 95%, like Albert mentioned, we were like pretty good in identifying uh, unique pages. However, uh, you always have edge cases. So let's say I have X and Y same, but within Y, and I'm, I'm like calling Y as duplicate, but within Y you have A and B, which is unique. So you'll have like, you cannot always predict like what is a duplicate pointing to, right? So links could point to something totally unique. So you have edge cases like that. But it has not been of the order that we had to worry about. We always uh, got an improvement over the past. And the way the sites are designed, uh, you know, the structure keeps on changing. So we pretty much got a good coverage out of it. Uh, so yeah, and then, uh, we also have like once in a while we scan without the uh, algorithm just to ensure like we try to go a few levels deeper and actually figure out if there are any things we were not catching earlier and we catch it now. We are also storing the uh, previous crawl results so that we can feed them as a seed so that you know we are trying to reduce the load on the site and we're trying to reduce the uh, positives at the same time ensuring that you know we finish the scan sooner. Okay, so. This is the first thing that solved our speed issue, the coverage issue. Uh, I also mentioned about uh, the sites that are driven heavily by JavaScript, like single page applications. Think of Flickr, think of Yahoo Mail, think of Search. They're like single, single page applications. So you essentially have uh, the first page being loaded, and then it is like heavily driven by Ajax or you know, uh, uh, by some framework and actually replacing the page content instead of like navigating to, navigating to another page. So uh, this looks like this. So essentially with a regular crawler, if you do, you cannot see a lot of the widgets and a uh, lot of the content that you see on the second image, right? So we essentially wanted uh, a crawler that can do the latter, not the former, because uh, the rich applications, the, one have, the ones that have uh, rich technologies, JavaScript and uh, whatnot, they will do a lot on the browser side. So we essentially wanted something which would render the DOM and which would do the navigation for us and figure out like what the web service API calls are and you know uh, how the data that's coming is being consumed by the web page itself, right? So, and this is not straightforward as it turns out. So if you ever observed your browser and you had the debugger and you're looking at like how the network connection on your network tab on your uh, debugger was doing, you would observe that page pages for the rich sites never finish uploading. They load fast as it is perceived, but they always keep on getting the content, right? So as a user, I know, okay, I'm done with this page. I'm gonna you know, close the tab, but when you're a crawler, you want to figure out what that time limit is or when done is done, right? So, uh, so we wanted something which would not be static. First of all, it will render the DOM. It could navigate and it could like stay there for enough time to ensure like all the events and everything is fired and there's no more further processing happening uh, in the DOM. Okay, so essentially this is what we needed. We needed DOM crawling. So. In a regular crawler, what you have is you go to page X, you figure out all the links, then you go to page X, uh, Y, Z, and A, B, C. What we wanted was we wanted to pretty much crawl the page itself, like click on different buttons, type onto different uh, input elements, and uh, you know scroll and pretty much navigate the DOM as a real user would. Because that is how you're gonna cover the links which are gonna be actually exploited by an attacker. So this is, we, this is where we, uh, yeah, so we used uh, PhantomJS, which is a headless browser for doing this uh, DOM rendering and navigation and automation for the crawling piece. And uh, so the crawler that we're gonna open source today, it has a script called as render.js, which essentially runs the PhantomJS process and does the DOM rendering navigation and uh, yeah, so we haven't done the recordings, but we have taken the photos just in case, you know, there is problem with the internet connection. Okay, so as you can see, it is 
firing different events, the click events, submit events. So in a regular crawler, you cannot get this done. You're not, never looking at you know the keyboard and mouse events. In, in this crawler, you're essentially doing a proper navigation as a real user would do. And what ends up happening is you will pretty much uh, enumerate different uh, API calls. You will figure out, OK, what the site uh, is, is looking like and how it behaves. So you can see we have the click events. We have the submit events. OK. Albert? Yeah. So again, we want to share how we are doing that so we can do that at home or in your company. So there are a couple of things that we want to go deeper and explain how it works. So we use PhantomJS because that you can leverage a lot of browser interaction. So here's one example that we are doing inside the script. Actually, this is the part that written by my colleague Adonis, who is sitting there. And the way this works is you will identify all the kickable elements in the pages, and then you try to kick all of them. The good thing for using Phantom JS is that we try to kick all of them, and we can observe what, how the page change. If the page, when you kick on certain things, we can know, oh, there's an additional outgoing request, then we can ca capture that. There's additional diff element coming in, we can also capture that. So all the things is basically done really gracefully in Phantom JS, but I bet there's mm, very hard to do that and in, if you are not scripting that well, so we are sharing how, how that can be done. So in order to observe whether anything get add, we, we also use something called the DOM mutation observer, which is a HTML5 feature available in the DOM API spec. But also beware that this, this is more like only available in PhantomJS version two rather than version one, because version one doesn't implement all the HTML5 API. So if you're going to use that, make sure you use version two, and you probably you need to compile that by yourself. And the other good thing is that I look at a lot of scanners, whenever they try to do calling, they analyze the HTML, and they try to get all the links. Some of them will have expressions, regular expression to do that. Some do a better job, some do a poor job. And when we're using PhantomJS, actually they've they done a really good job on doing that because you don't actually need to do, use any algorithm to extract links. The fact is that the DOM itself would contain all the links that's available. So the, the thing is really easy right now. I just need to say in, in the DOM, get the window doc, document and then get document.links and then you get all the lengths that you need to go deeper. So this is a really nice feature of using PhantomJS. And then there are lots of people talking about how, do, how you can do interprocessing between PhantomJS and the caller. How do you make sure the output actually get into the, the upstream execute, the function executor? So people talk about using WebSocket, people talk about using file. But think about doing that at scale. You want multiple PhantomJS inside a machine, then you end up having a section management problem. Like when I send something to this socket, who is sending that to us, right? There are multiple process running PhantomJS and you easily mess up everything. So the, this is another reason we actually, we consider using Go for that because Go actually have a really good JSON stream parser. So here's an example that how we, how we use that. So we define many different types of JSON object that we want to pass. And Go actually can figure out that when you hook the parser into the standard out, you can actually ask the program to emit different kinds of JSON object. And Go will actually figure out, oh, this object is a DOM message. This object is a response message. And in the program, we say, oh, when you want this PhantomJS, just listen to the standard out, pass everything. If you got the DOM message, then you send uh, you send additional links to the to the to the set to the caller. If it's a response body, we analyze the body and then we send those to an, uh, to the scanner. So it helps us to distribute the job in a much more decent way than using WebSocket and file I/O. That normal normally people would just consider those are easier, but for using Go standard out and JSON parsing is the best way for doing this job. Yep. 
So yeah, we spoke about scalability initially, like you know uh, what it means to us. So with the same amount of people or very less, you know, increment in the team size, we wanted to like scale from 500 scans today to maybe you know 100,000 sca uh, scans a day. Uh, today we are doing about like 2,500, but you know we want wanted to have an infrastructure which could scale very easily, and uh, the definition for that was. Uh, you know these items. So when we started building uh, the scanner, we, this is what we were looking at. So uh, using Go provides us vertical scalability because of its concurrency primitives. So you can use Go routines, which are like lightweight threads, and you can pretty much extract the maximum out of all your CPUs and uh, the capacity on your systems. But you run out of the vertical slots very soon, and then you want to like fan out. You want to have horizontal scalability. You want a system which can Essentially, uh, you know, publish some 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 job like, hey, I want these things done, and you have a bunch of uh, you know consumers who can say, okay, I will take on this job, right? So we want we'll talk about that. So we were stuck with horizontal scalability, like how do we scale uh, horizontally? We'll talk about that. Uh, we were very concerned about operational scalability as well. Uh, we didn't want uh, to have a big ops team. That you know, if one of the components went down, then we had to worry about because you always have hardware failures. You know, your VMs are going down or package upgrades and everything. So we wanted to make it like completely independent of any uh, regular issues that you come across in the ops world. So uh, yeah, so we wanted to also ensure like it's functionally scalable. What that means is uh, today my uh, Platform has like A, B, C, D feature. Tomorrow I want to add a feature E or F, or I want to remove B. It should be like very easy. It should not bring any downtime. It should not be like uh, causing any uh, issues to your user. It should be completely transparent. So we wanted to build something like that. Uh, and this is not like auto scaling. So auto scaling is a totally different subject. You know, where based on how uh, high your load is, you kind of scale automatically. So we didn't do that. We essentially still manage based on looking at our system performance, but uh, the idea was to actually ensure that we have our systems running and they're like very flexible. You can take pieces in and you know put pieces in or remove pieces out without worrying about uh, operations and uh, downtime enough. Okay, so that is where uh, microservices architecture comes in. So there is something called as NSQ, which is a publisher subscriber system in Go. And this is a picture taken from the Tech Museum, you know, uh, when we had gone for our uh, summer of service there. We were surprised, like, this is a, a, a what do you call it, a game or yeah, whatever it is. So, learning module. Uh, so, kids were actually coming and they knew what routers and servers are. They could actually connect routers and switches and actually make a server blink, right? They know how to scale. Sorry? They, know how to scale. they knew how to scale. <laughs> so, basically, use different components and, you know, actually help each other. So this is what we did. This is what NSQ does, right? So it's like a bunch of tasks listening, hey guys, tell me something what to do. And a bunch of guys, hey, you know, please help me with this one. So this is, that is what publisher subscriber is. And uh, this is what we are doing in uh, our platform. So you essentially have a publisher, which is like the intake system, which accepts, OK, you know, a CI system sends like, OK, I have these 100 scans to be done. The production system says, OK, I have these 100 scans to be done. You get the URL, you figure out whether the site is up or not, perform basic checks, like what needs to be done, the feature extraction in terms of uh, you know, the scanner settings and everything. And then you say, OK, uh, we need to fuzz this thing now. And you send it to the fuzz queue, and then you have you know, tasks listening there for the uh, fuzz tasks, which are the consumers. And they are listening uh, for these requests. And uh, you know, based on what you supplied, it will execute the command. And here we are you know, executing a Rakini. Just as an example, pretty much you can plug in any scanner and use it that way. So in nutshell, it, it allows you to uh, just add anything to the system or remove anything, write your custom scanners, custom fuzzers. So yeah, so this is an interesting piece. So when you have a system such as this, you have like hundreds and hundreds of uh, thousands of uh, tasks sending other results back. How do you collect them? Syslog, or what do you do? Do you do Splunk? What do you do? What the right solution is? So yeah, so one thing you know for sure is you need a aggregator, right? So when your task finishes, it says, okay, these are my results. Send it back to some system, and you have a result aggregator. So your 
tasks, your consumers, they process the results, they send it back to an aggregator, which could be anything, and uh, you know that would pretty much get the results from all the tasks and actually make a unified report for you so that you don't have to worry about which task did this or you know which machine or which Docker container did this command. It's pretty much transparent for a user. For, for a user, it is one scan and one result. It's not about like 100 tasks and so and so. OK. So uh, this is how it runs. You have the uh, NSQ uh, lookup daemon. You have the NSQ daemon. And then you uh, run the, so yeah, so, the, so we're going to open source this today. And this is how you can run it. So you have to run like multiple commands. So there's a standalone version as well. You can run that without it. Or you can run as a distributed uh, crawler. You want to run this? Yeah, we can run this. Yeah? yeah? We can run this one. So this one, we actually try to call the website. And you will send all the lengths that are unique to another queue. So we have another queue, and we, the queue itself will actually listen and see whether there's any new length that need to be fast, and you will send to Awakni. So here, we also use uh, one of our friendly project, which is called Yahoo slash WebSap Lab, which has a lot of vulnerability. And you can see, like, we can park this in and any machine, listen to the message queue, and you will execute it faster, and you will get the result back pretty quickly. Right. So, so yeah. So there is a cost. You know, when you have everything just plugged in like that, you're going to have false positives because you're not building those puzzles, and you don't know like what features, what the new thing is, getting you in. And it's a huge issue. It's a pretty huge issue, especially at a company like Yahoo, where you don't have consultants or dedicated folks looking at each issue and vetting them out and figuring out whether it is exploitable or not, and actually categorizing them in a correct severity metrics and you know propagating it to the users. You want to be very sure like how true the issues reported by your scanner are. So it has a cost. High number of issues does not mean good thing. So uh, especially when you're like sending it to, across to like a uh, thousand of engineers, you want to be ensure, you want to show like what are the things which can break the bill and what are the things which should not be breaking a build. It's a very contentious topic whether you want to break a build or not, but you have to be very careful like what the uh, you know your tolerance for certain kind of issues is. Okay, so uh, how did we tackle the challenge of? Eliminating false positives. We're going to talk about that. Uh, this is a project that is currently not open sourced. We are using that at Yahoo, and which is giving us about, I would say, 98, 99% accuracy for XSS uh, results that we get. Yes, that is true. And uh, uh, it's not open source, but we have a Reddit, Reddit talk today uh, at 2 p.m. by our colleagues, uh, Aaron and Nira, who are sitting at the back. And they're going to talk about. Uh, you know the context parser, which is a similar idea, which basically allows you to uh, figure out where my input is actually ending up, and based on where my input is ending up in the uh, resultant HTML, it will tell you whether it is really exploitable or not. Right? So, and they have done it for the uh, JavaScript template engines. I think uh, one is uh, Handlebars, and other is React.js. Uh, handlebars. Yeah. Handlebars. Okay. You want to talk about that? Oh, that's okay. Yeah, just okay. Yeah. So yeah. So when I asked my seven-year-old son, like you know, draw my photograph, he would actually draw something always, but it'd be always bad, right? So he get gets the face a little bit right. He knows the face is done like this. You have eyes, but then legs and hands are going everywhere. The hands are there or not there? Everything is going apart. This is what happened to us. We built like a lot of UIs. We did a decent job, but it's very difficult to keep up because you have a different new requirements coming up, and we are not like UI guys. Uh, sometimes we even make applications which are like doing the job, but they're not pretty. They're not like up to the standards of the Yahoo engineers, or just a resourcing constraint. So we gave up in building a UI, and that is where you have, you know, Kibana. Okay. Yeah. So the, the thing is that we are more like lazy engineers. So we don't build a UI. We don't want to show you really ugly drawing. Yeah. So what happened is that we found out that if we are able to send our report using JSON to some other TCP port, there are lots of 
available product in the market that we can leverage. One of that is we can use dashboarding using Kibana, which is an open source project. And as long as you use Elasticsearch correctly together with Kibana, they can do the dashboarding with all the indexed message so that if you send JSON there, you can say, I want to show how many scans has this keyword, how many scans has the URL, like financeyahoo.com, and how many of those has fundings. So this actually done a decent job of that. And also lastly, as Bishan always talk about, we, we actually haven't covered too much on how you can do CI correctly. There's lots of things that you should consider, like how fast you can finish the scan. Right now, what we are showing is that you can for party scanner, but they also have different, different uh, time constraints. Some of them one slow, some of them one really fast. And some of them also have a lot of false positive. So from our example, even we try to use some really good scanner, if you want that at scale, at scale false positive still is an issue. So we kind of like automating the and block, block or break certain bills in the CI pipeline could be challenging. And overall thing about that, what we actually want is that whenever we have issue, we probably want to check it using a, a issue management system. You can actually put those logic inside your logger and then whenever there's something happening, you can actually open a bug using your, your stuff and you can actually look at that and mark this is a false alarm or not. It actually do a decent job in our case. So I think time is running out, but let's do a quick comparison. Do you want me to do that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, yeah. so we are short on time, but yeah. you know, uh, this is not an apple to orange comparison. We are buyers, of course, because we built this. We have like some uh, sort of uh, yeah, tends, tend, tending toward that. So yeah, there has been uh, other projects in the community. You probably heard about Mozilla, Mozilla Minion, which is open source and uh, using uses Python Celery, which is similar to NSQ that we are using. Uh, but it's more built on the plugin architecture uh, and uh, you know uses the scanners that like we use as well. Uh, but the differentiator that we have done in this project is on the crawling piece, like we saw with the sim hashes and with the DOM crawling. You know, focusing more on the crawling piece and actually trying to make the overall process much more easier. Yeah, you know, skip this. So yeah. I think we already seen this as well. Okay. So I think this is the last slide for us. And uh, so what do you get today after listening to us for about 40, 45 minutes? Do you get a uh, you know, product you can start using it right away, or do you get a concept that you can like go and implement from once we open source? Uh, this is still a work in progress thing. You know, we still come across newer challenges, and we try to fix those. Uh, but you can like look at the source code. You can uh, reuse it based on the license. OK. You want to open yeah, source now? Exactly. Yeah, so thanks for everyone staying here. So right now, we want to share that we are going to open source this project. I actually put that in a private repo in slash Yahoo. And then right now, I'm going to play it happen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ah. I changed your password. You changed my password? Oh, OK. So right now, this project is open source. If you want to get a feeling how this stuff works, go to github slash yahoo slash griffin. Download that or start that or give us some feedback. And I think that's it. I think we also